want to pick up on some work that uh, To Be Serious is doing in a recent video in which she seems to be involved in a train of thought to do with empathy, particularly as it relates to evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, and the primatology of people like Franz de Waals. And I want to see if I can get to that idea, starting from uh, the selfish gene, Dawkins' idea of the selfish gene, which she mentioned in her most recent video. Uh, in a recent uh, interview that Daw well, an interview on, on the web, it is now in how recent it is, that Dawkins gives talking about that. It's, uh, he says that if he wrote it today, he'd perhaps change the way he wrote it slightly. And uh, I think one of the problems with the idea of the selfish gene is this word selfish, because it's deeply, it's a deeply human idea. Actually, I should just say where I am. I'm down at Dartington, and we have a, a Zen garden down in Dartington, which I don't very often come to, and here it is. It hasn't been raked out today, but it is uh, a gorgeous little garden. You know, normally it's raked, but I think it hasn't been dealt with because of the bad weather we've been having lately. So if you have a mind to sit in a peaceful place, this is the place. I'm very rarely in that mind, but uh, that's where I am. Um, okay, selfish too. And there are some problems with it. I mean, basically, what he's what he's saying there is that you know the, the form of human of the human body and the form of human behaviour, including human mental behaviour, psychology, is derived from the actions of genes, which we know, but that there is a kind of competition going on between genes, and there has been historically over that evolutionary time, uh, which. Uh, it's a competition which is uh, played out across the, uh, the form of the human body so that genes try to produce bodies which will uh, host, their, their, host that particular gene and which will succeed in the environment. So uh, the usually way that's described is that the human body is the gene's way of reproducing itself. Uh, and a lot of the language around that echoes this term selfish, that it is about a competition, that it is about survival, that it is about um, sometimes warfare, those kind of terms are used. There's a couple of problems with it, I think. I mean, the anthropomorphic problem of using words like selfish is something I'll come back to. But uh, for me, there's a bit of a problem in the model itself, and maybe I just haven't read enough, but it seems to me that all genes have a common interest in producing a body that will host anything at all. If any of the genes went off on its own, completely on its own, and uh, uh, didn't take account of the fact that other genes are doing things which will produce a body as well, then, uh, then there'd be a negative effect. I mean, all genes, presumably, are in the business of creating some kind of a body. Uh, you know, so they have a common fate in that regard. So even if you were to anthropomorphize, you would have to accept the idea that they are all working at least partially toward a common goal and have a lot of uh, mutual self-interest. But in terms of this anthropomorphic thing, I mean, yes, there is, you know, is that process going on, but you know, how, to what extent does it make sense to talk about it as selfish behavior? I mean, that's a, a very much a human attribution which Dawkins himself notes. Uh, and in, in, in genetic terms, does it make any sense to, to say that? I mean, we're basically applying a metaphor drawn from human social relations, a particular branch of human social relations, and animal social relations, um, a competition for limited resources, or a competition for access to reproduction rights, or a competition for access to territory, those kind of things. We're applying that as a metaphor to the behavior of what are essentially chemicals, um, but does it make any sense to say that? I mean, it, it, in a sense, it makes, to me at least, it makes as much sense to say that as to say that sand and uh, concrete and water are in competition when you make it into mortar for building a house, or to say that um, that there's a kind of a selfishness or a competition for survival of sugar granules when you're dissolving them in water. It's, you wouldn't think about it in those terms. Um, I know it's not exactly the same, but I think the attribution of, 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 of human emotions to, to genetic material is essentially applying, uh, it's a category error. You're applying psychological terms to 
chemical processes, not even biological processes, but chemical processes. So it doesn't make an awful lot of sense. And you certainly can't extrapolate from that, as many people have said, to, to say that because genes behave in that way, humans should too. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and of course, the other thing, if you must anthropomorphise, I think I'm repeating myself, if you must anthropomorphise, why anthropomorphise just that? You would have to acknowledge that there are lots of chemical processes go on that form bodies and that form life forms and that have always formed life forms which correlate with other kinds of human interactions as well as selfishness. I've already mentioned uh, that all genes cooperate in the production of the human body so you could just as easily call it the cooperative gene or the possibly even the empathic gene if you wanted to talk about it in those terms. Uh, but if you wanted to go further back in evolutionary history, you know, if you're talking about simpler life forms, if you're talking about something like an amoeba or some kind of single-celled equivalent to an amoeba that was around at the dawn of, of, of life on the planet Earth, then uh, it wouldn't make any sense to talk about selfish genes. You'd have to talk about other kinds of things. You'd have to talk about, well, I don't know, you'd be in, you'd be in a, an environment of fissioning and dividing and... and uh, and mothers giving birth to daughters and, and separating into twos and there, there being no kind of... You, in this, you'd be talking about immortality or something, you know, when a single-celled organism divides, does it die or does it just give birth to two daughters? Or, or does it continue into... You know, it, it's that kind of completely different narrative. If you're going to play out human narratives across chemical, biochemical, early biological systems, selfishness isn't the only human emotion isn't the only piece of the human narrative or the animal narrative to draw upon. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got to empathy, really. Yeah, I'll have to, yeah I, think, I think empathy, in the sense that empathy is the precursor to, an op to the opposite of selfishness. You, you need empathy to engage in altruistic behaviour, at least consciously altruistic behaviour. Uh, and I think there are plenty of kind of precursors for that in our evolutionary history. And you wouldn't even need to go to DNA. You wouldn't even need to look for the DNA or genetic correlates of altruistic behavior, which I know is one of the key arguments for um, empathy in those terms. You wouldn't even need to go for that. If you're uh, at least partially willing to accept the idea of the selfish gene, just drawing on a particular biochemical pathway to uh, to metaphorically apply that selfishness, then you might as well, as I say, talk about other, uh, other biochemical actions, chemical actions and biological actions, which mirror empathy or mirror dissolution or mirror sacrifice or mirror altruism or appear to be or can be anthropomorphized as those kind of um, yeah, martyrdoms. All, all the things that we would regard as possibly good and positive traits of human beings. You know, why stop at selfishness? <laughs>